Right, welcome to part one of your electrical module. Today we're going to look at generation, generation and supply. At the end of this part of the session, I want you guys to be able to give a basic explanation about the direction, direct and indirect current flow, and be able to identify these on a sign graph. Also want you guys to be able to recognise parts of the electrical supply, particularly as, as the, where the electrical supply comes into the property and identify which parts should be maintained by the electricity supplier and which parts should be maintained by the homeowner. I also want you guys to be able to explain the difference between regulations, standards and manufacturer's instructions, including describing the purpose of each. Okay. Well, what is electricity? A good place to start for this module. Electricity is the flow of electrons. Um, a flow can be generated in, in different ways, and we're going to have a look at uh, this now. So, the most most sort of common method of generating electricity is is it generates would generate alternating current, and this essentially is done by rotating a conductor in a magnetic field. Almost all electricity you guys are ever going to use will, will be alternating current, essentially. Um, it's what's generated in almost all of our, our power stations. Coal power stations um, uses create steam, which turns a generator, which spins a conductor in a magnetic field nuclear. The heat from the nuclear reaction causes steam which will then rotate a conductor in a, in a magnetic field. Wind, the big turbines, as they spin, they will rotate a conductor in a magnetic field. And hydroelectric, as the water passes through the, the channels, it causes a turbine to spin, which rotates a conductor in a magnetic field. So all of these uh, will generate what we know as alternating current. And in alternating current, the... It, the electrons are affected by the magnetic field and they are, they very, very, as it spins, they very, very quickly change direction. Um, and and that's why it's known as alternating current because the, the electrons are, are essentially sort of changing direction very, very quickly. So alter, alternating. Direct current um, you'd most likely come across direct current in batteries. Um, batteries uh, have inside two dissimilar metals and an electrolyte. An electrolyte is something that electricity, normally a sort of a fluid, um, but electricity can, can pass through. And with uh, batteries, you have two dissimilar metals. One would be described as an anode, the other would be described as a cathode. Um, and these metals could be any any metals, but they're normally metals that are quite far apart on something called the electromotive series, which we'll look at in a lot more detail in the principles module. Um, but long story short, the cathode would gradually start to, to sort of eat away at, destroy the anode, and, and the electrodes from the anode would, would then sort of be drawn towards the cathode. Uh, and, and because sort of the electrons are moving from one place to another, you, ha you have a flow of electricity. Uh, with a direct current, the electrons will only ever move one direction. They'll only ever move from the from the more anodic metal towards the more cathodic metal. Uh, and therefore, the electrons move one direction. So it's therefore it's a direct current. Um, you can also generate a direct current through photovoltaic cells. Uh, photovoltaic cells, um, as the photons hit the photovoltaic um, panel, uh, it causes the electrons to move, which then can generate a direct current. So, yeah, what are the key differences with alternating and direct current? Well, as we've already said, a direct current, the electrons will always move one direction, they'll always move the same direction from the positive, more positive side to the more, uh, sorry, from the more negative side to the more positive side, they should, they should be going. Um, but with alternating current, they, they change direction very, very quickly. 
you go backwards and forwards. You can see on the sign graph here that an alternating current would show kind of going in positive and negative and positive and negative. Um, and that's what we what, what, what we call this as an alternating current sine wave. OK, and we'll, we'll recognise that. But with a direct current, the direct current um, would always be just one side of the line because the electrons are always going the same direction. OK, um, supply of electricity. Electricity is transmitted from power stations at very, very high voltages. And we'll kind of find out a little bit the reason for this a bit later on when we look at uh, calculations. Essentially, the amount of voltage will, will have an effect on the amount of resistance. Um, yeah, like I say, we'll talk about that in, a, in a, probably the next session. OK. Uh, so electricity is transmitted from the power station at about 400,000 volts. It's then stepped down to the required voltage. Various places will have different requirements. Things like farms and factories will require more power because they've got some big machines that they'll need to run. Um, and quite often these will, will get what we call a three-phase supply. A three-phase supply has got three line um, wires in it. Line is a, is a new way of saying live, essentially. So they have three line wires in it, which would, would sort of actually supply up to 400 volts or possibly more um, to, to, these, to these places. But domestic supplies would be um, fed with a single phase supply. A single phase supply has one line wire, a live wire. Okay. Some areas of the house, uh, even at 230 volts is considered dangerous. Um, so in these instances, the supply would be stepped down using a transformer. Uh, a good example would be like for an extractor fan. Uh, if you had an extractor fan like right next to, to a bath, then you should make sure that it's, it's extra low voltage. Um, shaving sockets, quite often you'll see shaving sockets in bathrooms, they're ultra low voltage as well. Um, to, to minimise the risk to, to people uh, from from being electrocuted. Uh, as we already know, maximum voltage on a building site is 110 volts. So we're going to quickly look now at the electrical supply to a dwelling. Okay. As we've as your one of your targets for for today is, is to know kind of which one is the responsibility of the electrical supplier, which one's the responsibility of the homeowner. Long story short. Everything before the main switch on the consumer unit is the responsibility of the electrical supplier. So the main cable, as it comes in from the mains, is the responsibility of the supplier. The main fuse is the responsibility of the supplier. The electricity meter is the responsibility of the supplier. And one of the earth cables is the responsibility of the supplier. And that's the one which goes from the main earth terminal to to earth essentially there's various sort of uh, methods of earth in which we're going to talk about again a bit later on uh, in this module everything else is the responsibility of the homeowner the consumer unit is the responsibility of the homeowner all of the circuit breakers and all of the circuits inside the house are the responsibility of the homeowner and all of the main earth bonding, including the main earth terminal, is the responsibility of the homeowner, with the exception, obviously, of the one which goes to the to the main main earth, essentially. OK. And that's just literally what, what we're just saying here. So all of the parts before the main switch are the responsibility of the electricity supplier, including the main earth wire from the supply only. All the parts after the main switch including the rest of the earth and the responsibility of the homeowner. There's a few um, parts probably worth chatting through the now about the earthing. Uh, we should have a main earth terminal which would be connected to the earth bar in the consumer unit. They also they should be connected to any structural metal work and also to your water supply as it comes into the property and to your gas supply within 600 mil of your gas meter. Uh, regulations. Electricity work regulations places legal implications on employers to make sure that they, they ensure sort of 
safe working with electrical equipment. Part P explains how to carry out electrical work safely uh, from an installation point of view. And standards. Uh, BS7671, this is a key bit of information worth remembering, okay? It's also known as the wiring regulation sometimes, right? Even though it's technically, it's a, it's a British standard. Um, it contains loads of information about safe electrical design, installation and safe working practices, right? These are, this is basically an electrician's bible, you know, BS7671, it's the key standard that, that they need to, to follow, essentially. Uh, and if they follow that, they'll, they'll keep themselves within the law. Okay. Manufacturing instructions uh, give specific information about how to install appliances. Make sure you follow the manufacturer's inst uh, uh, instructions when you install an appliance. Okay. Right. Now it is time for you guys to do your quiz. Okay. <laughs> 